Hello, and welcome to the latest installment of our uh, quarterly series of public webinars from the Interagency Task Force on the Arts and Human Development. I'm Sunil Iyengar, Director of the Office of Research and Analysis at the National Endowment for the Arts. And uh, before we get going, let me just uh, go through some quick housekeeping notes. You are all muted and will be able only to hear us. Uh, today's webinar will consist of PowerPoint presentations and a short one-minute video. Uh, following our presentations will be a Q&A session. Uh, you can submit questions or comments at any time using the Q&A box below the PowerPoint you see on your screen. We'll do our best to address as many as possible during the time we have. Please do not use the raise hand button. And I um, also want to let you know that you can follow today's webinar conversation on Twitter at NEA Arts with the hashtag NEA Task Force. Also, please note that this webinar will be posted in the podcasts, webinars, and sorry, podcasts, webcasts, and webinars section of our website in a few days. So you can refer to it in the future, arts.gov. So um, I'm very pleased to say that we have some really distinguished speakers today uh, for a webinar uh, focusing on neuroscience, music, and learning. Um, first, we'll be hearing from uh, Jerry Kyle, who's the management and program analyst for the Professional Development for Arts Educators Pro uh, Education uh, Program at the Department of Education. Uh, I should say that uh, Jerry's been a really great colleague uh, and uh, actually as a partner, as a member of the Task Force on the Arts and Human Development for 17 or so federal agencies and departments across the government. Um, so we're very pleased to have him here today to tell us a bit about uh, why the Department of Education is interested in this work. Um, we'll be then hearing from Margaret Martin. Dr. Martin um, currently she founded uh, the Har Harmony Project, which we'll be hearing about today. The Harmony Project uh, currently maintains numerous full-time youth orchestras, and it works to develop youth music ensembles throughout, the, uh, throughout Los Angeles' uh, low-income low neighborhoods. Um, in 2009, Dr. Martin accepted the Coming Up Taller Award from First Lady Michelle Obama on behalf of the Harmony Project. Uh, the Coming Up Taller Award, uh, some of you may know, is administered by the President's Committee on the Arts and the Humanities in association with the NEA. Um, and I should note that uh, Dr. Martin herself uh, has received a President's Citizens Medal, I think that was in 2011, for, uh, for replacing violence in children's lives with music for the project. Uh, Dr. Martin's working with the LA Philharmonic uh, through their uh, Youth Orchestra Los Angeles initiative, and researchers from Northwestern University, that would be Dr. Krauss, whom we'll be hearing from shortly, and the LA Unified School District's Beyond the Bell after school branch. Uh, they're working together to document the impact of music education and your youth orchestra participation on disadvantaged youth. Um, next, we'll be hearing from uh, Dr. Nina Krauss, a professor at Northwestern University, investigating the neural encoding of speech and music and its plasticity. Her auditory neuroscience lab examines the neural encoding of sound in the normal system, how it is disrupted in clinical populations, and how it reacts to differing levels of expertise. Uh, the Krauss lab has developed an objective and non-invasive biological approach for the assessment of auditory processing that is becoming more widely available through partnerships with commercial technologies. And I should say that uh, Dr. Krauss is no stranger to the Interagency Task Force on the Arts and Human Development. In fact, uh, she was a valued uh, advisor uh, and speaker at the, um, at, a, at the convening we held last year in September at the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, at that time, the National Academies and um, the National Institutes of Health teamed up with the NEA to conduct a symposium on the arts uh, in terms of older adults and aging populations. And uh, Dr. Krauss's presentation was very effective there. Um, and I'm very pleased to say that Dr. Krauss uh, will be working with myself and a few others from the task force to present uh, to the Gerontological Society of America later this year. So we're looking forward to working with her in that capacity. So um, just to kind of briefly give you a sense of uh, the next, uh, just where we are with the task force before we go forward. Um, just wanted to announce a couple of things. Um, we had our last meeting in June, and at the time we were able to announce three, uh, four new members. 
Um, one is Marion Balsam, who's the director of research partnerships of the National Children's Study at the National Institutes of Health. We're very pleased and proud to have Dr. Balsam as a member, as well as Chris Spira and Mary Morris Hyde from the Office of Research and Evaluation at the Corporation for National and Community Service, uh, which is another agency now represented on the task force. And finally, we have Nadia Dabi, who's the Acting Assistant Secretary for Innovation and Improvement, replacing Jim Shelton in that role uh, with the Department of Education, who's now a member of the task force as well. So plenty of excitement and energy brought to this group to try to find ways to catalyze research and information sharing about uh, the arts and human development. Um, and I should say we have a couple of papers newly released. Uh, in addition to the report we announced last, uh, during the last webinar, the report on the arts and aging, uh, we now have a paper, the first of a series of papers that came out of that uh, National Academy's workshop. Um, it's called, Shall I Compare Thee to a Dose of Dinepazil? Uh, Cultural Arts Interventions in Dementia Care Research by Kate de, Mir Me Kate de Medeiros and Anne Basting. Uh, and they published this paper in The Gerontologist, but we also have a link to it online uh, on the website on the bottom of this page. Um, we also have a paper that I wrote uh, in response to a request to contribute to a special edition of the Inter International Journal of Applied Psychoanalytic Studies. Um, it's somewhat less uh, um, I should say, um, specialized or technical as some of the other papers. It's, it's really an overview of what we're doing with the task force for those of you who want to catch up, as well as to understand some of the NEA's investments in the area of psychological well-being research. So those are some of our uh, accomplishments to date. Um, I'm now going to uh, turn it over to Jerry, goes by Kyle, uh, who's going, Jerry Kyle, who's going to be, uh, who's going to be speaking to you about why they, at the Department of Ed, they find the work of uh, the Harmony Project and Krauss very important. Thank you. Kyle? Good afternoon. The purpose of the Arts and Education Program is to strengthen arts education as an integral part of the elementary and secondary curriculum and to support efforts to enable all students to benefit from quality arts education and to demonstrate competence in the arts. The U.S. Department of Education funds several programs under arts and education. There's the AEMDD program, which is the Arts and Education Model Development and Dissemination Grant Program. There's the Professional Development for Arts Educators Program, or PDAE. We also have the Arts and Education National Program. All three of these programs have slightly different purposes and eligibility requirements. But with all the programs, we encourage intensive professional development for arts educators around arts education and arts integration, sharing of resources and curriculum development, and a strong evaluation model. We also encourage collaboration and partnerships among schools, school districts, state education agencies, and arts organizations. Arts-rich experience can be beneficial to students, as a matter of fact, all age groups, and that's why we're happy to be part of the NEA task force to identify and further research regarding the arts for lifelong learning and the role of the arts in human development. Our programs encourage the participation of low-income at-risk students and art educators from schools that serve a significant number of low-income at-risk students. While the Harmony Project is not one of our funded grants, we are delighted to see the impact their music education program is having on at-risk children in California. Great. Thank you, Kyle. Um, I'm, I'm, I also want to thank uh, your colleague, Kyle's, uh, Tony Fowler, for his work in helping to bring this together. Um, OK, so now we're going to turn it over to Margaret and, um, and Nina. So Margaret, take it away. Okay, here's our story. A group of hardcore Los Angeles gang members stopped to listen to a little kid playing Brahms on a tiny violin in a farmer's market. They wore tattoos, shaved heads, gang clothing. After five or six minutes without saying a word to one another, I watched those gang members pull out their own money and put it gently into the little kid's case. Those gang members were teaching me that they would rather be doing what that kid was doing 
than what they were doing, but they never had the chance. My name is Margaret Martin, and I'm a doctor of public health. I founded Harmony Project in 2001 in the belief that if children from low-income homes could be engaged and challenged and mentored throughout their childhood, they could defy the odds, more fully achieve their unique potential, and better compete with their more advantaged peers. At Harmony Project, we believe that music is the ideal way to engage and challenge and mentor children from low-income families for multiple years, from early childhood all the way through to high school graduation and beyond. Why music? Music holds a, a unique place in our lives. It helps us process and express our deepest feelings. It's intrinsically therapeutic and rewarding. It elevates our mood without harmful side effects and it can bring people together like nothing else. Music is also challenging. Learning to make music takes years of focused practice. Musical practice develops the habits of mind st students need to succeed. Music also provides an effective means of social inclusion. Youth orchestras, bands, and choral groups help kids bridge differences in race, culture, gender, and age, and give them practice working closely with one another toward shared goals. From 36 students in 2001, Harmony Project enrollment now exceeds 1,600 across three states. We are supporting the development of additional programs throughout the country, and we have been honored with two presidential awards at the White House in the past four years. Hundreds of students fill our waiting lists, demonstrating the vast, unmet need that Harmony Project seeks to fill. So what exactly do we do? Harmony Project provides students with musical instruments and five or more hours of structured music classes each week, after school hours and on Saturdays, with professional musician mentors. Classes are provided year-round and tuition-free, based on family income. We also build full-time bands, orchestras, and choral groups with our students in the high-crime neighborhoods where they live. As students advance, we train them through our service learning program to mentor their less advanced peers, and we develop their leadership by supporting their work as peer mentors. We require our students to remain enrolled in school as a condition of participation. Harmony Project commits to students for their entire childhood, from early elementary or middle school through high school graduation and our own scholarship program helps our students go on to college. Students typically participate within Harmony Project for five to ten years. Through Harmony Project, thousands of children growing up in LA's highest crime gang reduction zones have demonstrated that they would rather spend their after school hours in challenging music classes and rehearsals than join gangs or get into trouble. What kind of impact have we seen? Over the past six years, 96% of Harmony Project high school seniors have graduated on time and have gone on to college. That's in Los Angeles gang reduction zones where dropout rates approach or exceed 50%. Harmony Project graduates attend or have graduated from Dartmouth, USC, NYU, UC Berkeley, UCLA, Tulane University, and dozens of other colleges and universities. I want to acknowledge the exceptional people that make Harmony Project thrive across three states. Now Dr. Nina Krauss will tell you what we're learning from the groundbreaking research her auditory neuroscience lab is doing with a cohort of Harmony Project students, research that helps to explain why the at-risk students enrolled in Harmony Project are beating the odds and are achieving such outstanding academic success. We'll turn it over to you, Nina. All right. So, research suggests that music education offsets achievement gaps. Insights from the Harmony Project. So, I'm a biologist and I study learning. And we can measure how neurons respond to sound by recording from them directly in animals and we've learned that neurons will change how they respond to sound once the animal learns that the sound has meaning. But how do we assess the biology of learning in humans? Uh, we've developed a biological approach where the participants listen to sounds, they can be speech or music, any sounds, and we record 
how the brain responds to those sounds. We record that activity with scalp electrodes that picks up the electricity, which is the currency of the nervous system. As I'm talking to you now, the nerves in your brain that respond to sound are giving off electricity, and we are able to pick that up. Now, our approach has some unique features. The first is that it captures the acoustics of the sound. If you see that blue wave, uh, you can see that uh, that is the sound wave, and the red wave is the brain wave. And you can see that they physically resemble each other, and you can actually play the brain wave back through a speaker, and it will sound like the sound wave. So first I'm going to play the sound wave and then the brain wave. Da. Da. Now uh, you will hear a scale and then the brain's response to that scale. And finally, some deep purple, and then the brain's response. So what is very important about this uh, biological approach is that it is experience dependent. And um, we've learned that music experience can enhance sound processing for language. And we know that this is the case across the lifespan from toddlers, school-age kids, young adults, and older adults. And we know that musical um, experience, and I mean I'm, uh, these are amateur mus musicians who are playing music as a hobby but playing consistently, um, have communication skill enhancements. They hear uh, important sounds like speech in noise better. They have better auditory working memory, auditory attention, and rhythmic skills. And importantly, their underlying biology. So the way the brain represents consonants, which carries so much meaning in speech, uh, the way the brain represents speech when it is presented in challenging listening environments, and the way the brain represents patterns and rhythms, um, these are all very important ingredients for literacy that we see improved in people who have had musical experience. But there's a huge knowledge gap. What about the biological effect of music that is delivered in school-based group settings. So we have the Harmony Project and a Chicago Public School Project. What unites both of these groups and these projects is that the children, the participants, are coming from low-income areas. So first we asked whether poverty compromises auditory function. And to do this, we looked at our Chicago high school kids and divided them based on their maternal education. And we know that there is a well-defined relationship between maternal education and income. Uh, there is reduced linguistic stimulation in children whose moms have less education, and this has been called the 30 million word gap by the age of five. And we have found that there is a biological impact of maternal education. One is that the kids whose moms have less education have more neural noise. You can think of it as more static uh, when you are listening on the radio. Um, there is just more background noise in the nervous system. Um, and at the same time, the signal, so the response to the sound, is diminished. So that gives you a, a pretty unfavorable signal-to-noise ratio. And finally, responses to sound are less consistent in adolescents whose parents, whose mom, um, have uh, fewer years of uh, maternal education. And all of these are ingredients for literacy, biological ingredients for literacy. So what is the impact of music education, then, delivered in group settings? So we have 150 uh, students enrolled in our Chicago high schools and 80 
students enrolled in the Harmony project. And the experimental design goes as follows. First, we obtain a number of biological measures, uh, just like the ones that I've been talking to you about. And then we figure out how um, these children's communication skills um, align. And so we measure their reading skills, their ability to hear speech and noise. We probe their cognitive abilities, so their um, auditory attention, visual attention, uh, memory skills, and then we look at their emotional and social development. Then the children go through one year of music education. And we have a number of control groups, either groups who have no training at all or groups of, of children who have uh, another form of enrichment. One year later, uh, these same identical measures are repeated. And not only one year later, but then again yearly. So uh, with the Harmony Project, we've assessed second graders, third graders, and our team has just come back um, having finished the assessment of fourth graders. Uh, the high school kids, uh, we assess them from freshmen to seniors. So you can see that um, it takes as almost as many years as, as, as children are in the Harmony Project um, for data to really um, emerge. Um, so nationally, we know that the education gap widens over the first four years of school. And we asked whether music can offset the academic gap between the rich and poor. So here are our very early findings with the Harmony Project. So we assessed reading, reading scores in um, second and third graders, and we found that the children who uh, received no intervention, in fact, followed the national trend of uh, having their reading scores diminish from year to year. Children in the Harmony Project are holding their own. In fact, their reading scores are moving in a positive direction. And we find this enormously encouraging. We've now looked also at hearing speech and noise, because uh, we know that as a musician, uh, a musician is constantly listening for complex sounds for sounds in a complex soundscape. So for example, the harmony line, the melody line, was, was a string plucked or bowed. And that's really very similar. It's a similar task. Um, it's akin to listening to your friend's voice in a noisy restaurant, or listening to the teacher's voice uh, when there's traffic outside, or the air conditioning, or uh, chairs scraping. Uh, and we already know that across the lifespan, uh, musicians have biological advantages um, in hearing speech and noise so that this music training transfers to the brain's representation and people's representation of speech. So uh, these are the kinds of tests that, uh, that, that, that we uh, administer. Um, so you'll listen to this. Embedded in that noise is a sentence. Maybe you can hear it better in this condition. So the children need to repeat back what it is that they hear. And this way, we can get a sense of how their hearing and noise ability um, may change over the years. Um, what we know across the lifespan um, what I'm showing you here are brain waves in response to speech sounds. And what is very striking is that if you compare musicians and non-musician responses in quiet and noise, you will see that the brain waves are almost identical. It is as though the noise has not degraded. It has not had any deleterious impact on the brain's response to, um, on the brain's ability to represent the speech sound. Um, the non-musicians, on the other hand, uh, you can see that the noise has had a tremendous impact, and you see a very diminished response to the speech sound. So looking at our Harmony Project kids, as we move from second to third grade and we look at the control group, we see no change, no difference in our assessment of speech and noise measures from year to year. But the kids in Harmony Project in fact, significantly improved 
in their speech perception and noise abilities. Uh, here is a student quote. I believe music has helped me focus more. I'm not sure how, but I'm able to concentrate more easily with loud noises around. It's a great skill to have, especially in hectic situations. What about biological outcomes? So we know that if we present a sound, uh, the brain will respond to that sound and the response will be delayed and degraded. And we found that one year of classroom music training had no effect on the brain's response to speech sounds presented in noise. However, after two years of music, this is in our adolescence, uh, we have seen that music training, um, in the, the children who had music training, they had faster and more precise brain responses to sounds, to speech sounds presented in noise. Um, and we did this by comparing the brain activity that we obtained in the same child, freshman and junior year. Another way of looking at uh, this brain activity timing is to look at uh, this colored plot, which essentially um, the more red you see, the faster and more precise the brain's response to sound was uh, in the junior year compared to freshman uh, year. And you can see that the control group uh, showed no such improvement. So we think that this has implications uh, not only for better learning in noisy classrooms, but in other situations as well. Um, what happens after you stop playing music? Does the brain continue to profit? The answer is yes. Um, well, how many of you have played music uh, as children and are no longer playing? Uh, it turns out that that is the, the most common scenario encountered. Um, and the way we looked at this is we looked at um, uh, Northwestern students, almost 50 of them, and we compared them um, and match them in every possible way we could think of except for the numbers of years of musical experience that they had in their childhood. And we found that the children who had five years of music training or more had larger responses to sound and they had less neural noise. So this translates into a brain that is uh, uh, delivering a much more favorable signal to noise ratio um, with respect to the sound that, uh, that it is processing. And the kids in the middle, uh, with a middle amount of training, um, just they, they fell right in the, in the middle group there. Um, interestingly, this benefit, the same benefit, seems to maintain even in old age. So uh, these, when we've looked at older adults, and now it's been decades since they have had musical experience in childhood, we still find that older adults who have had musical education have brains that process sound more efficiently. So let me wrap things up. Uh, if you get nothing else from what I have talked about, um, it is, I, I would like you to, to, to really think about uh, the lesson I, I get from this, which is that we are what we do. Um, and this gives us an enormous responsibility, both personally and for how we raise our children and how uh, the educational decisions that we make. Um, so music really has the power to shape human brain function within one's lifespan. You can really think about um, a person's life as a, a an experiment in evolution. Uh, music enhances sound processing for language skills, so for reading, for hearing and noise, and cognitive skills such as auditory memory and attention. The brain is clearly shaped by our sensory and social environment. We see effects, biological effects of deprivation in the form of poverty and enrichment in the form of musical training. And what can we say about school-based group music instruction? Well, it appears to foster the development of communication skills, reading, 
and hearing speech and noise. And we're seeing that it offsets this academic gap between the rich and poor. And importantly, it seems to fundamentally alter the nervous system to create a better learner. Um, now, we have a long way to go. This is just a beginning. Um, but I would like to acknowledge the many people who are involved in this project. Um, it, the project is like a, a barn raising. All of the people in red are involved in it. And in particular, I'd like to uh, acknowledge Jessica Slater, who led the uh, team that collected data this year out in LA, and Dana Strait, who led the team on uh, the first two years. Uh, our work, our infrastructure is uh, supported uh, by the government, as are our many studies on uh, learning in the brain. And uh, our neuroeducation work is uh, supported by NAM, the Knowles Hearing Center, Grammy, and the Mathers Foundation. Finally, let me leave you with a snapshot of our web page. Um, I invite you, please, to visit our website. And uh, we have a, a great commitment to share our little discoveries, what it is that we learn um, with the public. And um, so we have these slideshows, which are unique. Uh, I, I think, to, to our website. If you look under lab project, each lab project will have a slideshow um, that will essentially consist of a series of, there will be a picture and a line of text that will summarize two years of work. So you can get an overview of the work that we're doing. And of course, if you want the nitty gritty, you can download the publications. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. And thank you, Margaret. Uh, this is Sunil Iyengar again, uh, Director of Research at the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, I wanted to notify people that if you were listening by phone to this presentation, then the audio uh, apparently didn't, the, the sound clips that uh, Nina played did not go through. However, uh, we will be archiving this presentation as with all of our um, webinars, and uh, it'll be on our website, arts.gov, and then be able to access the audio. And, very soon for this to be archived. Uh, sorry that you were listening on the phone. Uh, for those of you on, online, you should have uh, heard the clips. Um, let me just also say that um, to remind people, you can submit questions or comments at any time using the Q&A box below the PowerPoint you see on your screen. Uh, we've got about, I see about half an hour. We'll do our best to address as many as possible. Um, please do not use the raise hand button. OK, so with that, uh, I'm going to take up a question here and sort of add one of my own onto it if I can. Uh, this is for uh, Margaret. Um, the Harmony Project, they want to know uh, what the potential is for expanding the project right now into other states. Is there any, uh, can you talk a little bit about where outside of California this project is, is being implemented perhaps? And secondly, uh, this is my part, uh, curious about how you decide which kids get into the program and what's the, I'm sure there's a big waiting list. How do you make those hard decisions? Oh, okay. Well, uh, the first question is: um, I'm the I'm the expansion director for Harmony Project, and I receive requests for information from groups around the country, and I work with them to develop local support for the development of Harmony Projects in their own um, communities. The way we run Harmony Project is we do it through cost-sharing partnerships with um, local organizations. For instance, our program in Miami is being administered out of the education department um, as an outreach uh, project of the uh, University of Miami Frost School of Music and is being staffed entirely by um, undergrad and graduate uh, music students, um, which creates a wonderful pedagogical opportunity for the students as well as um, opportunities to connect at-risk kids in the community with current um, college-going uh, mentors. In Ventura, California, the Harmony Project program is being administered through the education department of New West Symphony, uh, which provides a great in infrastructural support in that community. Um, in my, <clears throat> I'm sorry, in New Orleans, uh, the program 
is uh, sponsored by Trinity Church on Wall Street, the local Episcopal diocese, and partners with local charter schools and with Tulane University. So we've got a variety of um, ways that uh, Harmony Projects can be set up in a community. In Los Angeles, we partner with five different school districts, including uh, Los Angeles Unified, with the Los Angeles Philharmonic, with LA City College, and with the Recreation and Parks Department, um, among other local partners. So um, that's, uh, and I welcome requests for information. It's, it's my favorite thing. It's what I spend uh, most of my days doing. Um, uh, I, I come out and, and visit in communities and meet with local groups of stakeholders to discuss how to organize the program in a particular in a particular community. In regard to how do we pick kids, gosh, Sunil, uh, we do have hundreds of kids on our waiting lists, and that's a, an exciting thing. It's all based on funds. We invest about fifteen hundred dollars per student per year. And we don't enroll kids unless we expect to be able to stick with them over time because we do um, commit to uh, our students for their entire childhood. This is based on uh, fundamental research that came out of the RAND Corporation's uh, landmark arts and pro-social impact studies um, uh, some years ago. But um, we we take kids off of the waiting list that have been there, and right now it's I guess it's about a, a one and a half to two and a half year wait. Um, occasionally we get funds to that permit. Per, be, occasionally we're funded to uh, open a new site in a new community, and then we'll do outreach in that community. But our students are all Title One kids, so the fact that participating in our programs not only uh, provides mentoring and role modeling and uh, practice in discipline and persistence, but also is, as, as our partners at Northwestern University are helping us understand, it's also rewiring our kids' brains and making it easier for them to learn and succeed in school. It's a huge thrill. Thank you, Margaret. Um, I'm now getting reports uh, through people typing in that, unfortunately, the, the music, uh, some of the sound clips, again, if you didn't hear those uh, during the presentation, either online or on the phone, please tune in later. You can, you can get the archived version of this, and we'll have the sound clips up for you. Um, I've got a couple of questions about um, whether the type of music matters. I guess this would be for Nina, um, whether it's classical, jazz, hip hop, or uh, you know, Western, Eastern. I mean, ha have there been studies about, I mean, it, clearly you, you kind of, you ran, you know, you played some rock music just now. I don't know if you've tried different types of music in this concept of listening and attention uh, in terms of being able to drown out uh, neural noise. Uh, Nina? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Anil, for that question. Also, um, you know, for those who didn't hear the sounds, in addition to um, looking at the webinar online, um, if you look at our website on the home page, there's a demonstration um, that if you turn your, make sure the sound is on on your computer, you can uh, hear uh, some uh, similar demonstrations and uh, under technologies we have a whole uh, slideshow again with audio uh, that is called The Brain Sings and Speaks. Uh, so that may be of interest to you. So thank you Sunil for your question. Does the type of music matter? Um, fundamentally no. What is important is that the sound to meaning connections are made and these important sound to meaning connections that unite the important circuitry in our brains so we can think of our brains as consisting of sensory and cognitive and reward circuits and uh, making music of any kind uh, will engage all of those circuits and so uh, the type the, the, the genre, the instrument, uh, does not matter in terms of the, the profound impact that music has on communication skills and on the way that the brain gets sculpted by the experience. That said, there is specialization of the specialized so that um, if you look at how a piano note is represented in the brain of a pianist, it will be different. Um, more precise than uh, if you uh, measure the brain's response to that same note in a bassoon player. So there is some specialization. Um, so you know, our, our, our brain is just 
constantly being shaped by our experience, but in terms of the fundamental um, uh, effects of music experience on the nervous system in terms of communication skills, cognitive skills, and uh, brain development, um, the, 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 the type of music does not matter. Uh, and Sunil, I'd like to add that within Harmony Project, we have large classical ensembles, we have salsa bands, jazz bands, hip-hop orchestras, um, our kids play um, bluegrass, and uh, all kinds of different um, uh, flavors. The flavors don't matter, but the, the, the fundamental program is scalable and replicable. Great, thank you. And, and, and Nina, did you... This, the presentation you just gave, um, did it cover the updates? Were you referring also to the Chicago Public Schools research in that as part of the findings, or is there anything to share about the Chicago Public Schools experience? Yes, I uh, in your work and with so um, I, I spoke both of our, you know, because you know you, you realize that that these projects take such a long time to um, to. Uh, to to undertake and uh, and and uh, the. Um, you know, so we're just after many, many years getting um, getting early findings, and so uh, some of the findings, uh, especially the biological findings, uh, were from our um, adolescents who we have. We're already now. Uh, we we have tested them for three years. We're into the fourth year, um, so we're a year ahead with that project um, compared to the Harmony project. Great. And um, Mar uh, Margaret, I think I'll give you another double header. Uh, one is okay. uh, somebody's asking in the current educational environment, how can educators leverage these findings? Um, and I think here they're talking about funding opportunities or you know, kind of making the case about their work um, about music education specifically. And, and so far, I know it's still very early days, but are you seeing a sort of clear pathway to kind of you, you made you said may, you gave us some really good statistics up front about graduation rates. Are you, are, are you, do you have any, um, have you started to harvest some of this early information yet about music uh, on the brain? Well, uh, in, in, it, it's kind of a, I'm not sure I'm clear about the second half of, of your question, but I'll, I'll start with the first. I mean, we've got a, uh, we've got a basically a 50% dropout rate in our 50 largest cities. And these are largely kids from poor families uh, uh, and poor families of color who are dropping out. Um, so and this has been a real stubborn um, construct. And it's been, it's been a stubborn problem. And we haven't had something that we can specifically do to fix it. What the research that with uh, Northwestern is showing us with our little kids is that and, and what our experience with our students, what we've seen empirically and what we're now seeing confirmed by the neurobiology is that sustained music learning, learning to do music, not listening to it, but do it, um, literally um, helps to fix those deficits with which disadvantaged kids, kids from uh, families where the mom has a low level of education present which makes education itself, the capacity to learn, uh, uh, more successful for those students. And it helps the low-income kids better compete with their more advantaged peers. So the fundamental take-home for me is that in any low-income community, kids should have five day a week, I mean, as much music education as possible. We're, we're delivering about five hours a week. Um, on, uh, three times a week. We've got a, a three-hour Saturday orchestral uh, 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 component and two uh, during the week after-school classes. But this is, this is something that educators can, act, can actually uh, apply to fix the ability of their kids from uh, low-income homes to achieve on par with their more advantaged peers. And um, I mean, this, the, this, this research takes music education off the shelf of the warm fuzzies. You can no longer say that, uh, that this is um, 
fluff or, or oh, enrichment. This research shows us that music education with disadvantaged kids provides the foundation and the structure upon which education itself can be built. And uh, I mean, because clearly the kids, the matched controls in our study in LA public schools who were not enrolled in Harmony Project did not thrive and they were not learning to read. Their, their abilities declined over the same period that the education system was working with, our, with, with the kids who enrolled in Harmony Project. The kids who enrolled in Harmony Project's a reading ability improved at the same time that the match controls reading ability declined. So it's the, 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 the implications are clear. We're very excited to see what happens with the third year assessment and we've only just now collected that data and Nina's team is busy at work analyzing it. But um, in the meantime, educators throughout the country can start to invest their remediation funds in, um, in music because that will fix neurologically the issues that limit our kids' capacity to learn. Thank you, Margaret. I'm actually going to hold off on my other question, the other question because we were just getting so many at a rapid rate. And I'll come back to you, so thank you very much. Um, uh, Nina, um, a question here. Have you looked yet at the ability to double task due to enhanced hearing, i.e. take notes, complex transfer processing while listening to a lecture such as this? Uh, and this comes from, they say, an, uh, an HP orchestra director. Yeah, so this is a, a fabulous question. And in fact, we do have uh, some assessments uh, specifically looking at um, uh, kids' ability to, uh, to, to pay attention to what is important uh, and to ignore distracting signals. So we have this in both visual and auditory domains. And, um, and actually, probably the, 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 the strongest evidence that we have uh, thus far is um, in speech, in noise, because um, in, in order to be able to uh, pull out the, the sound of the person who you would like to be listening to in a noisy environment, um, you're really needing to uh, ignore the irrelevant information. So this is a kind of, um, of, of multitasking, if you will. Thank you. Uh, Nina, what's really kind of what seems unique about this whole presentation in a lot of ways is how much attention there is to the bio hard biological outcomes. Um, I'm wondering, based on some of the questions people have submitted also, about the um, sort of the social emotional factors, if those are taken into consideration, perhaps, the, I know in one of your slides you said at the pretest, uh, social emotional, I think, showed up there. Yeah. Um, and curious about how this, this work on the brain might extend to that of, uh, you know, when we talk about attentional capacity and some of the issues related to social or emotional behavior, you know, kinds of yeah. issues. Um, uh, so, so that's, that's a, a very, very important question and one that, in fact, we are looking at and we have a number of uh, ass assessment measures uh, to look at. Uh, kids' uh, emotional and social development, and uh, this is something that uh, we intend to look at very, very closely, and also very closely as, as we learn more about um, each specific child, because, um, you know, we, we're getting information also about um, how engaged each individual child is in, in the Harmony Project per se, um, and so I think we're going to be able to um, connect those dots um, and uh, my expectation because of how uh, the neurobiology of learning works, um, it really would appear that um, you know, learning depends on the use, uh, the combined use of our sensory, our cognitive, and our rewards so or emotional system. And so combining all of these things um, we know um, produces the best learning. So we know from experimental animal data where uh, the situation is very, very highly controlled that animals will learn faster and they will remember what they've learned for a longer period of time if at the same time their emotional, their limbic system is being stimulated while they are learning. Um, and music 
as I see it, is I mean you know there there, there are many ways that that we can learn, um, but music is is a quintessential model for learning um, because it so inherently involves our auditory, um, our sensory, our cognitive, and our reward systems simultaneously. So it certainly feeds into everything that we know um, is will, will produce efficient and long-lasting learning. Uh, so the, the uh, this is clearly very high on our our list of um, factors to look at. Thank you, uh, Margaret. Returning to you. Um, I think you noted that a, uh, one of the factors in choosing s students to, to come into this program is you know, the durability, how long they will commit to being part of the program, correct? Um, one of the questions was about uh, what kind of requirements you set for parental involvement and student attendance. Well, our student attendance uh, requirements are high. At the same time, we appreciate that. Uh, a lot of our students rely on public transportation and, and particularly our youngest students rely on their parents to get them where they need to be, uh, especially for the Saturday morning rehearsals. But um, uh, we, we're, we're, we're fairly strict we've, uh, about our attendance requirements. We have regular um, uh, parent education programs that we carry out. And in fact, we have... Um, at several of our sites developed uh, musicianship and uh, recorder classes or choirs uh, for parents themselves to permit the parents to be able to learn the language of music and share that with their kids. Um, so yeah, parents are a, a very big part of, of what we're doing. Um, in relation to the last question, I'd like to add that uh, Harmony Project programs, the glue that keeps the program going are the ensembles, large and small ensembles. And th here's where, um, uh, where peer pressure comes in. We love peer pressure. Peer pressure is when the, the kid who didn't practice, uh, the kind of tricky kid who's used to getting over on somebody, uh, doesn't sound good. And the little quiet child says, you want me to help you learn that? Um, it, you, you, uh, ensembles permit kids to demonstrate what they've learned and to be accountable for the use of their time. You can't learn unless you practice every day. Over and over, the, the, the students come back to us with that. And then they start to tell us that, they, that they've, they're applying the same lesson to their school studies. And they realize that if they can't learn to make music unless they practice every day, they're not going to learn to do well in school unless they do homework every day, unless they study every day. And, and so we're seeing these, our students tell us that the habits of mind tend to generalize. But socially, they're playing in an ensemble. And I can't, cannot stress enough how important this is because the, each kid knows that they matter in that ensemble. But they only matter if they all work together really, really closely. And a three-hour band or orchestra practice is three hours of kids practicing doing just that, agreeing. So it's the most fantastic metaphor for community. Thanks, Mark. And there are always uh, performances coming up, so there are always reasons to be doing it well. That's great. Thanks, Margaret. Um, so we probably have time for just two more questions, one of which is, um, and, and this is one I like to ask uh, whenever we bring researchers together with practitioners in the arts. Um, how do you how did you two get together? I mean, what was the how how easy or hard is it for people out there doing quality arts programming to find a researcher or you know whether it may not be particularly with neurobiological outcomes related, but it may be in fact some other aspect of the outcomes related to the arts that they want to study in terms of human development. Um, how did you connect? I guess Margaret or or, or Nina, well, either one. We have such yeah. a great story. <laughs> well, well. Uh, we had so I took a look at we had these really long waiting lists, and we have time in program of five to ten years. So that's sort of a great lab, and that and then plus we had kids who were showing up with bucket loads of AP classes in which they'd done really well and going off to fine colleges. 
defying the odds. I mean, these are kids of, of domestic workers and laborers. So I cold called uh, Peggy McArdle at the National Institutes of Health and asked her to, and she, she it was at the end of the day, and she actually picked up the phone, and we chatted for some time. And when she heard what I was doing, she got all excited, and she said, you need to know what Nina Krauss at Northwestern University is doing, and she needs to know what you are doing. So I called Nina, and the rest is history. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great, uh, great uh, thing to do in public service. That's great. That was a yeah. That was a great <laughs> connection. Um, so um, a question here is: Did you collect? Uh, this is for Nina, I suppose. Did you collect any measures of executive function? And maybe you could explain for people what that is. Yeah, so Nina. Thank you. And if and if yes, were there any EF effects? Yes, thank you so much for, for that question. So measures of executive function, um, the, the the ones well, um, we met we match the kids for IQ, but with the measures of executive function that we focus on are auditory working memory and visual working memory and attention, both auditory and visual. Um, so let me say something, and we know in our cross-sectional work across the lifespan that people with musical experience um, are enhanced in their auditory working memory and in their auditory attention. Um, why is what is working memory important? I mean, just uh, the reason that you can understand what it is that I'm saying um, right now that we can have this conversation is because uh, you can remember what it is that I just said. Um, you're using your auditory working memory and thinking about what it is that I've said. And this is what um, a child needs if he's going to be processing what a teacher is uh, saying to them in, in the classroom. Uh, so these are very, very important communication skills. Also for reading, you have to remember what it is that you've just read. Uh, so working memory and attention are, are great big cognitive uh, factors that uh, we are following over time and that we already know are enhanced in individuals with music musical experience. That's great. OK, so uh, thank you both. I want to thank both of our speakers for this uh, really fun-filled, informative webinar. Uh, everyone will uh, go online, I hope. And, and if you didn't hear the sound clips, check them out. It's pretty fascinating, particularly the, how the brain actually sounds versus uh, how we hear, hear certain music, um, the brain waves versus the audio waves. Um, were you going to say something? I'm sorry. Um, uh, so Neil, I'd, I'd just like to invite anyone who's interested in in discussing and uh, learning about how to set up a harmony project in their community to get in touch. Um, I, I'm a, uh, I, I believe that um, um, well, my email address is Margaret M A R G A R E T at Harmony hyphen Project dot O R G. Thank you, Margaret. I'm glad you, you brought that to their attention. That'd be good. Um, and also, uh, people, if they want to sign up for future webinars or if they, they want to just check in with us, please email fedtaskforce at arts.gov, as shown on the slide. Uh, I also finally want to thank um, the amazing webinar team here, uh, Daniel Beatty, uh, Jillian Miller, uh, David Lowe, and Phil McNeil. And also, uh, couldn't have done it without our colleague, Ellen Grantham, in the Office of Research and Analysis, and uh, Tamika and Shingler and Sally Gifford, too. So thank you all, um, and we'll look forward to seeing you next quarter.